Whoa. Chris. Oh Waiting for Roderick and Michael, and I just saw them pop up, so. How's it going? Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Hi, Kevin. Haven't met you yet. Hi, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. I'm so excited for this. I know. Me too. Thanks for having me. Of course. I like your setup, Kevin. I like the microphone, the backdrop. Well, you got it. <laughs> I, I had to make it like a little professional, you know, <laughs> like but make, make like a little coverage here. Kevin, yeah. Kevin well, I'll be like honest. It's like the first studio. time I've actually. I know it does look like a professional studio. <laughs> <laughs> Roderick, what's up, man? What's going on, man? That is a that's a very nice setup. I thought that the virtual backgrounds would work on here, but I guess not. <laughs> See what happens when you assume? Yeah. <laughs> We've all learned that lesson before. Uh, Kevin, we're getting real good at this. 1201, we have everyone on. Mike's working. Oh, there man. we go. Oh, like professional. We should teach a course. <laughs> I'll post it on LinkedIn and see how it goes. <laughs> All right. oh, amazing uh it's everyone we're gonna kill this uh there's some polls over there too we'd love to know who's out in the audience um so there we go oh wow <laughs> there we go <laughs> love it Everyone, welcome to uh, Building the Modern Revenue Team. Uh, this session's on enabling your sales team to win. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Kevin, and we have three amazing guests, which I'm super excited to hear about. Um, this event is brought to you in collaboration by the Addicted to Growth Show. I'm going to drop a link to their podcast. Um, Kevin and Travis King are the hosts of that. Uh, Rodwick is ready on it. Michael is already on it. Pre, I think we got to maybe get you on an episode. Should be on it soon. Um, we'll see next. how this goes. <laughs> so I'll drop that in the um, in the chat. Check that out. They are awesome. If you need to get pumped up in the morning, if you're a sales leader and you need some good ideas, um, all the episodes are great. There's an amazing one on hiring and scaling too that you should all listen to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve, um, but. Let's kick things off. Kevin, the format today, we're going to do it a little different, right? We're going to half hour, 40 minutes with the panel, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. So everyone in the audience, if you see that little share my audio video, when we open it up to questions and Q&A, you could pop on and you could talk to our panel. We want this to be interactive. We don't want this to be that boring old WebEx that Pfizer shooting out every day where you just sit there and fall asleep at your computer. So these are three... Fountains of knowledge. Let's get as much from them as we can. So, Kevin, I'll pop off. I'll keep an eye on the chat. And um, I'll ping you in like 30, 40 minutes if we're running over. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. So so thanks for that, Chris. And, yeah, really excited for today. I, I know personally have learned a ton from from these individuals, following them, speaking with them. Um, and so we wanted to, to bring it out to everybody else, do some Q&A. Um, we've got some really cool topics we're going to dive into, but as, as Chris mentioned, we're, we're super excited to open this up. Um, it's all about learning. It's all about growth and it's all about tailoring this to the, the questions that you have that are going to enable you to do, uh, do better and, and bring it back. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I'd love to kind of go around the horn real quick. If you guys can give a quick 30 second intro to who you are, where you're from, what you're all about, and maybe a, maybe a fun fact that, that, you know, people out there may not know about you. So, Apri, why don't we start with you? I knew that was going to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so it's Apri, E-P-R-I-S. Sounds like A-P-R-E-E. -E. Uh, and I am at Monday.com, so leading their sales enablement program management. Currently, I'm in Atlanta. I uh, just actually moved my things last weekend in 60 hours from New York City back to Atlanta since, as I'm sure many of us know, we're not really sure kind of what the next six months hold. Um, but really excited to be at Monday, uh, spearheading not only scaling the team, but kind of the topic at hand of how can we continuously enable our teams, especially as we're onboarding people and what do we do with our talent that's already ramped um, and engage them in remote work. Uh, 
A fun fact that probably only my closest friends know or either coworkers is that I put whipped cream in my coffee every morning. <laughs> and I think you should all try it because <laughs> it adds a little element to your uh, to your morning and brings a little joy. And on the weekends, I put sprinkles. I love it. I love it. That's, I'm going to have to try that now. I'll, I'll be the guy who like, yeah. does a little in the coffee and then one straight to the mouth. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's it, it changes part. your morning. I promise. <laughs> uh, Michael, let's jump to you. Hey everybody, um, my name is Michael Tuso. I'm the Director of Revenue Performance um, at Chili Piper. Um, so I've basically been here since um, since the company started. I was one of the first uh, uh, customers and then decided to come out on, on board and build out the uh, sales team and enablement program here. Um, and a fun fact about me um, is I've lived in three other countries so Costa Rica, Bolivia, and Peru. So that's my fun fact. <clears throat> Amazing. Amazing. And Roderick. So I'm Roderick Jefferson. I'm the CEO of Roderick Jefferson and Associates. We're a sales training, sales enablement, and sales coaching firm. A little on my background, uh, sales guy. Started as a BDR, also carried a bag as an AE, and transferred from there into sales training. I think sales enablement, sales productivity, sales effectiveness, all those titles over the last 20 plus years. I've run enablement at Siebel Systems, uh, Network Appliance, eBay, HP, Oracle, Salesforce, and Marketo. Those before, yeah. <laughs> I think if we catch on one day, I'm counting on it for the stock. <laughs> and uh, Roderick, what, what's something that people may not know about you, a fun fact about you? So one fun fact is I absolutely love bocce so much that I actually have a bocce ball court built in my backyard. All right, I love that. I love that. Excellent. So, so guys, let's let's kind of dive right into this. Um, you know, just to kind of set set a stage or set a foundation. I think one of the things, you know, one of the things I find when having a lot of conversations around the topic of sales enablement is everyone kind of defines it a little bit differently. Um, and and I also think it's it's a topic or a category that's becoming bigger. There's more more falling underneath the, the sales enablement umbrella. So. Um, maybe we'll go in reverse order here, but, but, but Roderick, can you kick us off? Like what does sales enablement mean to you? Well, I, I think, and thanks for, for the kickoff. So I think mine will probably be different. I look at sales enablement as where it's going and I'm calling it sales enablement 3.0, not where we've been today. And that is really focusing on how do we help your customers maintain the customers that they have at one point, <clears throat> excuse me, my answer would have been getting the right people in the right conversations the right way with the right tools that ultimately leads to acceleration, accelerated speed to revenue, increased seller productivity, and also customers for life. But I think with COVID, it's changed, right? Now it's about mitigating risk. It's about cutting costs. And it, again, helping your clients or customers to maintain the customers that they've got today. Amazing. And, and Michael, how about you? How would you define sales enablement? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it, a, a bit of in a personal way. Um, so I, we actually considered making like enablement and it, it was a part of my title, but I actually, because of this dilemma of how it's defined so differently across the industry, you know, we actually ended up defining my title as, as revenue performance because of that. Um, and, and enablement really isn't just like someone who is updating content and sharing content with your team but they are key stakeholders in the company who are helping drive the results of the an entire team. And so the way that we think about um, enablement at Chili Piper is really owning those learning outcomes that are key and, and directly tied to, to revenue. And so they're, they're, they're not just, you know, uh, a, 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 a check mark um, for organizations anymore, but um, you know, off of what Roderick said a little bit, the future of, of sales enablement is having that, more leadership role at the table where they are a key stakeholder as well in the outcomes. And it has to do totally with the learning um, outcomes of everyone in revenue facing roles. So, um, so, so that's how we, we view it here at Chili Piper and excited to talk about that more today. Amazing. And, and Apri, what are your thoughts? Batting cleanup is kind of tough, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would, I would echo what they said. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing and I mean, even Roderick, what you said of, look, I, I started as an SDR, went into account management. And I think the biggest transition for me into training, which is now over the last 10 years evolved into what we call sales enablement, is truly 
that, you know, normalizing work and the outcomes. So where I'm very much into process and operations and strategy, especially in these times, it's enabling, you know, the outcomes and having those, you know, learners understand or even just the entire sales org, including the leadership team of what are the expectations and empowering them to do that. And I think it comes down the way we approach our onboarding and again, our reinforcement training is, you know, what's the process? What's the pitch? How can that improve performance? And it's that practical application of, can I walk away from reading this article, listening to this podcast, you know, jumping on this webinar, jumping on with the subject matter expert that's a top performer that's going to exceed expectations and actually leave this call or leave this moment and apply what I've learned. So it's that practical application and making sure that it is crystal clear of what those steps are. What is it? What should it look like? What should it sound like? So when we highlight, you know, the best practice or call someone out, how do I replicate those behaviors um, and kind of embed it in my day to day, especially as we're working from home? Amazing. Yeah, no, I think it's good just to kind of set this, uh, like I said, a foundation of, of what it is we're talking. It's it's uh, it's beyond just training. It's beyond just just learning. It's It's really you know, one of the things I heard from all of you is, is really around outcomes, right? And it's about driving better outcomes. Um, and obviously, like no one, no one predicted this this pandemic. You know, as, as we're we're in this new environment and it's challenging and it's different. And so, with all of this newness, like, what are some of the challenges that you guys have have faced, uh, and how did you overcome those? Thank oh, you. It's on mute. Oh, yeah. Roderick, you might be on mute. There we go. That mute button always gets me. I think what's <laughs> changed for me in, in our business is we were similar to most sales me, but we were face to face because we're in the people business, right? Yep. And so it's it's really focused and shifted to how can we get folks engaged, not just interacting, right? And so now that the world has become virtual like we are today, how do you connect and make those relationships? How do you show, you know, compassion and EQ and, and, <clears throat> and connect with people on a, a personal level, but still come across as authentic? And I think for a, a good way that COVID, if there's a good piece to it, is the fact that enablement, it's made us get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because we, for the last 20 years, <clears throat> excuse me, have been doing things the same way. Now, certainly technology has advanced. But when you look at the processes, the programs, the, the tools, et cetera, we've been doing it the same. Now it's really forced us to step back and say, how can we show value and make sure that we're not seen as the fixers of broken things? But to Michael's point, that we become now ingrained in the fabric of a company so that we're now a part of the culture and not just kind of like IT when something's broken, then when you're best friends. That's not what yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was going to say something similar. Like, I think one of the things when I think about enablement, especially over the past six months or so, um, I think of the idea of becoming adaptive instead of reactive. And many times people put enablement in place like, oh, we need to do enablement. All, like, like they wake up one day and all of a sudden it's this thing that we need to be doing. Um, but but I think that companies are quickly learning that you can use enablement to be adaptive to your team so that even in a time like this, you can still be profitable. You can still show your team how to be successful. You can still drive those really important outcomes. And that's through this adaptive like mindset. And when you when you use sales enablement for all the power that it's it that it is, you're able to to anchor performance of the team where that where it needs to be instead of always reacting to things that go wrong. Um, and, and so that's something that I've really been focused on from from an enablement perspective is not you know you know not sort of every reacting to everything that's going on right now, but how can you win today in this environment? And then also plan to do a really good job when, you know, the days are better and, you know, uh, companies are rebounding. So that's where my mind is at right now in terms of like how enablement could be a key driver of all of those things. And, you know, we don't have to feel necessarily like, you know, like victims because this negative externality, ha you know, is happening to us. Yeah. But instead, we can we can be adaptive and, and still choose to to thrive, you know, obviously there's some industries that are adversely affected and, you know, should definitely have empathy for those people. But for a lot of SaaS companies, there's a real opportunity there. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I think from my experience, I mean, I've always been remote. So in my teams that I've managed have been remote. So um, even being a sales leader, playing a sales enablement in dual role as a sales leader of the West Coast team from my previous company. And I think I took that into practice as I started even at Monday.com. I was like, what were the challenges I was facing? And I think, again, it's there's a lot of misinterpretation like and misunderstanding, whether it's from communication and it's empowering people to feel like in this moment of time when I'm frustrated or I have a question, you know, do I have to wait for my one on one? Do I have to wait for that next sales team meeting? There's too much time that passes and we have to be able to be responsive, but be responsive in a present way. And I think that's the biggest thing that we're trying to create this, you know, culture, you know, of just honest excellence of look reach out even if you know i don't have the answer right away but don't wait until the next call and we have to separate those gaps and if there is misunderstanding knowing that it's okay like i was dealing with it yesterday i was like no you're not getting me i was like i'm just about i'm a slack call you i'm just, gonna, <laughs> just tell me if you're on a call like you have to be in the moment because we waste time and it causes frustration and so i think especially as we're all remote Find those moments of where you're frustrated or you're having to like take a breather and remember to apply that. And how do we proactively to what Michael's saying, like really get ahead of it and create that space of empowerment and give that authentic you know, experience for everyone. Because otherwise it just kind of goes if not. I mean, a training can be a training, but if my day to day, I don't feel empowered. I don't feel like I'm supported. It kind of, you know, is all you know, not worth any of our efforts. So it's just remembering that human element and um, picking up the phone, right? Ema too much gets lost. Yeah, just that's talk, been the challenge. Right, just talk to one another. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I think, you know, we're we're seeing so much around EQ and, and empathy. And, you know, there's, yeah, I think people are trying to adjust how they may have traditionally sold and how they're going to market today. And they personalization and they're selling like a human and then there's all of the, there's a lot of new buzzwords out there that I think people are are really clinging to in an enablement function how do you work with your teams like how do you coach that how do you guide that how how do you empower them to go out there and be empathetic or to to be a bit more themselves i i think it starts with modeling that right especially with your teams if if you show this piece because let, let me step back for a moment What's important to your manager is imperative to you. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, if you are modeling this and you're showing it, they're going to learn from that, good or bad, and then they're going to go out and put that into practical application. The other piece is staying connected and, and, and also connecting, not just with them, but where are they going to their end customers, right? You can't just stop with your team. You've got to be visible as well. Because unfortunately, too many times, sales management leaders have been ivory towered. And they send the team out and we're all about strategy, architecture, execution. No, we're not. We're about people. How do we find out to what Michael was saying? How do we find out how we can help them with fire prevention instead of firefighting? Mm. So that has to be the, the number one shift, right? And then I think the other thing is being empathetic with your team. I start my team meetings the, the same way with a simple three-part question. And that is, and you know where I'm going, Kevin. I know. <laughs> do you want me to listen? Do you want me to coach? Or do you want me to fix? Because it does two things. One, it shows you as a leader what ears to put on for the conversation because we're natural fixers. But that may not be what we need. And it also shows the other individual that this is all about you. So you tell me how you want me to play the role today, and I will do that. Then guess what happens? They take that out to their customers. They take that out internally and externally. And they take that same mindset out of, I'm here to help, not to sell. Yeah. And, and I know, Michael, like you're, you're definitely one to get in the trenches with your team. I know you're super passionate about you know, all this stuff. Would love to kind of hear, like, what are some of the things that, that you're doing today that's working well? Yeah, um, I'll start with one of the things that I don't like first. Um, <laughs> so... so uh, one of the things I don't like in terms of this conversation around empathy is the whole like in these uncertain times. Like yep. I, I think we I think we've all had this like messaging of like straight you know it's been normalized, but I'm, I still like you wouldn't believe the emails I got um, kind of around this. And if if they aren't saying it, they're kind of treating it like it. You know, sales leaders kind of dancing around instead of like leading like literally like conversations that are like oh I can't wait until 
you know, things are back to normal. I'm like, there's an opportunity right in front of you, um, re regardless, again, of, of those externalities. So um, the thing that I'm really focused on right now, right now is like, again, to Roderick's point, like how can we show our team how to help our customers, whether it's like reducing time on tasks that they shouldn't be spending their, t you know, their time on that we can help automate or um, helping them get more customers. Like that's, that's really what we want to get after ultimately and, and get them more revenue um, and, and make them successful. Like we want them to be the hero. If they're the hero, then, then we're doing fine. And so really showing that the sales team so much of like the coaching that I've, I've delivered in the past three, four months um, to the sales team um, has really been around just getting to the main concern of, of the prospect. And it sounds so simple to do, but in execution, it becomes like much more difficult for people to do. And so mm -hmm. I've actually created entire like frameworks just around that one issue of just like get to the heart of what the prospect actually cares about and mirror that back to them. Um, and, and so much of this like empathy conversation is not saying, oh, I'm here to help if you need me. No, it's doing something about what they're telling you they actually need help with um, and then showing the sales team how to do that. So if it's a customer trying to churn all the way to, you know, an SDR trying to book a new opportunity, so much of it is like getting to what they actually care about in that business context. And, and it really has done w wonders. You know, I think some of that approach, like our SDR team actually ended up having not just their best month during all of this, but their best month of all time. And some of it is attributed to to kind of that thinking that we were able to scale across the team. So, you know, some of this stuff isn't like rocket science, but if we really just focus on making them successful right now, um, both our teams and our customers, um, it'll it'll really go a long way. And how are you kind of managing through or handling some of these situations today? Yeah, so I think internally the biggest thing for us are, um, you know, beyond onboarding is the reinforcement training. So again, um, you know, we're kind of the the back end. The we help orchestrate everything, um, and it's us finding these subject matter experts. So we know that people are, you know, a little bit. Even though we feel like we have so much more time because we're working remote and we don't have commutes. Like, and I agree with you, Michael. Like, right? Like, I, I think the empathy is there, but it's also like let's just embrace the reality of what it is today. And it's not only going to level up our organizations, but we're already thinking differently of how many people will be going back to the office. So it's just be present in this moment in time. So going back to the internal, we're doing these, um, you know, reinforcement sessions and it's us taking the subject matter experts, you know, on time management, you know, where people are struggling, knowing that there's interactions they've never faced before from home life, um, as well as being able to, you know, let others shine. So this is kind of professional development for these individuals that, you know, are looking to get to the next level and we're, you know, helping hey, let's bring your best practices to life. Because as I'm sure many of us know, when you go to a top performer, the way they describe the things that they do is, well, I just, you know, do this and um, I'm, you know, I go about it this way. And I'm like, okay, well, we got to unpack that because I can't, I don't know how to say, well, I'm really excited about this opportunity. And that's the reason why I put all the effort in all the steps you're going to cover. I'm like, well, no, no, no. Like I need to be able to write this again, this practical, when I walk away from this call with you, Diego, for example, how can I put this into practice? So it's us breaking, like getting in, doing what enablement does best, like pulling out what are these like tactical things that they're doing and then presenting that to the team to level them up. As far as the customer you know, is concerned, when we do those things, we are giving the customers a better experience and kind of taking them through that like challenger mindset of understanding that, you know, we have to get them to the point because the organizations we're speaking to, whether it's, you know, small businesses or enterprise or SaaS companies, you know, we're all in this of not really knowing what's next. And so, again, getting to that normalizing these outcomes and empowering them to know that you have to be able to pivot in time and knowing that your customers, they may be on a decision path or a timeline, but be ready to shift. And how do we start to identify those or get ahead of that proactively when we're dealing with customers so that they understand that, you know, the pain of same, you know, has to be like greater than the pain of change. And we need to support them in that change, whether that's buying a SaaS product, whether that's, you know, going a different direction, uh, 
But I really do think that it starts with just, again, that reinforcement training um, and coaching and enabling our leaders um, and, and giving them the right materials and resources to, to do that on a more frequent, consistent basis. Yeah, and I, love the, I love the fact that you said like unpacking, right? Because I think there's going to be some people that are really, really good at a certain skill, but it doesn't mean that they're great at teaching others how to do that, right? And there's a certain skill set and there's a certain expertise to unpack that, dissolve it and put it in a format that's then consumable for, for, a, for a team. So I love that you, you mentioned that. Um, as I'm kind of looking at some of the results of the polls here, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. So there's, a, there's a close to a 50-50 split between organizations that have sales enablement and those that don't. So I want to ask some questions that are going to address you know, both groups really. But so for those who don't have sales enablement, is, is there a key moment? Is there a trigger? Is there some type of inflection point in the growth of an organization that's, hey, we should start thinking about this. We need this. And, then, and how do we do this the right way? Because I'm sure there's a lot of companies that have stumbled around that piece. So for, for those who don't have sales enablement, what should they be thinking about of when to incorporate this into their business? Uh, again, I'll jump in. This is what we do as a consultancy is help build the plumbing. So I'm happy to, to address this one. Look, when you've got a number of sales folks and your team is growing, your product is out there and, and there are folks selling beyond just the founders. <laughs> Let me be clear there. Um, <laughs> it's time to really start thinking about scalability and automation. And so I say you've got, you know, eight, 10 sales folks you're already in the mix of needing someone that can own the sales enablement process. And what I mean is from mm -hmm. onboarding, excuse me, let me step back from talent assessment and acquisition. Yep. Right. Because now, especially in, in COVID times, our IEP ideal employee profile has shifted. And plus mm -hmm. there's so many more folks that are available now that weren't before. So mm -hmm. maybe you're going from a, you know, a quick burn and churn cell to now a, a long-term complex cell. You've got to make a shift. Then you've got to look at all of the other pieces that come into play. Do you have someone that owns onboarding? Do you have consistency and scalability? Do you have um, role-specific enablement? Do you have a, a learning path that's in place? What are you doing for your sales leaders? If those are the kind of questions that are coming up, you are right in the mix of time right. to bring in someone to own that. And it can't be your sales leader because – they, they are focused on revenue and then on their side job on the weekends, they're thinking about enable. And plus yeah. you're only gonna get what's in that one person's head. I'm so glad you said that because I, I just wanna point out that the impact of like what Roderick said, that's so important. You know, Roderick has scaled that at so many like really like notable companies. And, and there's a lot of advice out there that says, wait, until, I've literally have heard, wait until you're $50 million in revenue, right? We've all heard that. And I'm like, well, what are you going to, what are you going to do in the, in the meantime? Like you know, when I, when I, when I interview, um, you know, I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people and the number one thing when you wait, the number one thing that young people, especially anybody really wants as a part of joining a company is always growth. How are you going to, you know, encourage that growth of people without dedicating resources to sales and enablement? I just, I, I, I don't understand that that concept in general. And I'm a bit biased because, you know, we put, I was the, you know, first management hire and enablement was in my title at the time. So we were less than, you know, 10 employees and we actually just hired a VP of sales. So we basically kind of scaled it a little bit backwards. And uh, I haven't really heard of many companies doing that, but we were successful you know, and, and scaling around this idea of like building a culture of learning and really showing people, you know, one of the biggest problems I think in sales today is that we tell people to go do and we don't show them how. And then it's like, you know, how are you going to put people on performance improvement plans if we've never taught them how to do it to begin with? So, yeah. uh, so I, I th I'm totally with Roderick, like do it on the, on the onset, dedicate the resources to it and you, and you'll, you'll do a much better job at talent retention and, and revenue across the board. And, and you'll also learn so much um, having invested in it early on. If you, if you wait too late, it's, um, you know, you have to make up for that lost time. So I totally agree there. If you have a, I agree, Michael, if you have a VP of sales in place and your leadership team at any point starts talking about growth, that's when you need to hire sales. Exactly. Yeah. 
I agree. So even Roderick, like I'm sure you can attest to this as well. Like when I co-founded a company very similar, um, that was our, you know, our approach was when we get on the phone, do our assessment. And it was all about, it was VP usually, right? They just got a little bit of funding. They're going to grow. And I was like, okay, do you have your top performers, you know, their best practices, their workflows, their processes, you know, is it documented? Can you share it with me? And they're like, <laughs> I'm like okay, so to, Mike, to Michael's point, like, yeah, you're at 50 million, but what if you could have been at 75? Or what if you could have been at 100? And the only way to really get there from a scalable and more predictable way is that enablement function. And so I, that was my challenge of, well, what if I said, you're actually in a manager role because you were a top performer. Mm -hmm. Well, what if, you know, your top performer left? Well, I'm still selling. He's like, well, I just have to go back to selling. I'm like, well, that's not ideal. And so that was kind of our, our coming into this of, I totally agree, Roderick. Like the moment that that, I mean, I would even say hire them in tandem, that VP of sales. So then there's a synergy there. You understand what you're going for. You prioritize accordingly and then you execute. Yeah, because to, to both your points, if you've gotten to 10 million in your company and you don't have enablement, you're not building a company. You're building the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it makes it makes a ton of sense. And I think so let me ask this then. Why why is there such why do companies wait? Right? Like it, it seems like it makes sense, right? Like you've got a good product market fit, you're seeing revenue, you're seeing it grow, you you you're probably assessing your your total addressable market, right? But and maybe it's hey, we have to hire this VP of sales and, and we think that this person can do the VP of sales roles plus the enablement function. But I don't know, what what, do you, what have you guys seen? Why do companies wait so long? I think part of it is, is it's our fault in enablement. We have not given a clear yeah. definition because if you ask 10 people right now yeah. what yeah. enablement is, you're going to get 12 answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And yeah. the problem is yeah. we have not defined consistently. Think about like PMI, right, for project management. They have all of their terms, their nomenclatures in place. We don't have that in enablement. And also it depends on where you are in the maturation cycle of your company and what you need may be di will be different as you continue to mature. And so why don't we start building that out as an enablement profession and say, when you're at 10 million, it should look like this at 20 at 50 at a hundred. And then folks have things you can move towards. And in, in a sports analogy, the goal post doesn't move. You know, yep. the goal, you know, where the target is, go and hit that target. Yeah. And I think it goes back to that, you know, whole thing of where people are doing dual dual roles, right? A lot of your management, your leadership team, you know, before that VP is likely made up of your top performers. Yeah. Um, but, you know, them having to play those dual roles isn't scalable, you know, beyond just kind of the kind of iteration and the, the pivot in the company. And I, I think it's also because they were the ones who came on board where we've all been the first, you know, one of the first 50 or first 20. It was like, oh, when I got here, I was handed something <laughs> or I didn't get anything. I just had to sit by somebody um, to not thinking about like, what is the ideal state of that? Because the cost of one employee and losing them, you know, through attrition and, you know, and I asked this to a new hire the other day. I mean, he has, you know, 15 plus years of experience. And he said, Apri, this is like one of the best onboarding experiences. And I said, you're type A, I love it. Give me two to three reasons. And his three reasons were, it was a detailed schedule. It was structured. Like I felt like I knew what was expected. I knew what was coming. Um, if we needed to pivot, you were, you communicated with us. The second one was there was a guided path. Like you, it, we were immediately in the tools. We were doing it. It was hands-on. It was practical application. I knew what was expected of me. And it was, you know, coming to life versus just reading an article or just listening or shadowing somebody. Not that those things aren't good, but it was, we gave that blended learning experience. And then down to the last thing was just transparency. And he just said, I've never been in a remote. I've never, you know, learned this way. And the fact that it just was well thought out and we're still iterating on it. It's, it's definitely like, we're kind of at like, 1.0 yeah. of the version that I want it to be since I've been at monday.com for three months. And I think that's the thing is because we forget about, you know, the value of that one employee just coming through onboarding and that first day, what's their experience like and how that magnifies everything else. Um, but I think it just goes back to a lot of times as leadership, you know, those I've been in that position, right, where I play dual roles. Uh, but that's not making, you know, empowering, putting them in a position to scale yeah. and grow the business so then they can focus on what should be their top priority. I'm so glad you mentioned that because one of the topics we definitely wanted to dive into was, you know, 
with with this new environment that many of us find ourselves in like how do we effectively onboard and and, and you just kind of hit the three pillars of it which is great um and, and michael one thing I, I know you and i talked about on on the podcast episode was like we'd love to have this case study to show roi from enablement right like what would the difference be to hire your first sales enablement you know individual versus an individual contributor right and i think a lot of companies try to scale and grow through headcount versus the supporting cast. Have you made any progress on that case study, by the way? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, um, I'm still like thinking through that, but um, yeah, I, I think that so many times, and I think, you know, some of this pressure comes from VCs that like headcount doesn't like necessarily equal like re more revenue. And I think sometimes we think like, oh, just like more gasoline, you know, through headcount will equal more revenue. But, you know, it's like you still have to do a lot of ongoing, like continuous education. You still have to iterate and make your um, onboarding process more metrics driven. I think like, you know, why are we teaching the things that we're teaching? Why are we doing it in that order? Like wh how, how are we breaking down, you know, to the priest point, the the schedule and the onboarding schedule like and then are we tracking the the hiring outcomes to then how or the hiring decisions to how they actually ended up performing in onboarding and in ramp and i think part of uh this is that sales enablement is more nascent than some of the other you know roles in sales and so we're we're learning to coalesce around single definitions um and we're also becoming more metrics, more metrics d driven to that, you know, point of, of ROI. So um, I'm still, you know, openly having conversations with, and, and researching this with um, other kind of sales enablement leaders. And um, the thing that I've, I found that I like is that a lot of them are putting a lot more metrics behind this role and measuring you know, what, what is the success, what does it actually mean to be successful? And then how do we, um, how do we continue, like, how do we continue to drive outcomes based on that? And, and also like answering the question, why do we do things the way that we do it? Um, and so that, that's been kind of an, an interesting journey for me. Yeah, no, it's amazing. <laughs> oh, God. I love that you talked about why, because for so long enablement has been stuck in the who and the what bucket, right? Mm -hmm. And if we don't get down to the why, then again, I go back to what I said earlier, we become the fixers of broken things. And with metrics, it's always been smiley sheets and butts and seats, right? <laughs> that has shifted. Please, enablement professionals, stop talking about that. Because now you're trying to get the world to speak our language. And it's also cute little vanity stats, right, to make us all feel good. Instead, why don't we talk about metrics from two perspectives? One, what enablement influences? And then secondly, what enablement owns? Influence. I think we influence things like, you know, average deal size, um, deal velocity, pipeline creation, product mix, quota attainment, and those kind of things. What we own are the needs analysis, the programs, the usage stats, the LMS, the, the content management, and all those pieces. Pull it all together, and now you've got a nice little gumbo. The problem is we don't go back to sales leaders and say, what's important to you? What we do from a consulting is here's a laundry list of all of the various things that we could cover from a metrics perspective. And that's just on the front end, right? And then you go to CSMs on the back end and you're talking adoption rates and ARR and churn rates and engagement rates and all those things. Go to your sales leaders and say, I've got this laundry list of stats and metrics that we could bring to you, but what's important to you? And then narrow it down to no more than three or four of those. Because if you go beyond that, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. And then do that quarter over quarter and make sure that you're communicating that back. So I'll say in, in a prior life, one of the companies I worked at, when I walked in, time to first close for new hires was 88 days in the SMB space. Two and a half years later when I left, it was 54 days. How do I know that? Because we went in to see our, the sales force and it told us that because we were tracking those stats. We didn't say, I feel like, or I think we're doing better. Exactly. No one cares about that. Give them hardline figures, and not yep. just ROI figures, but COI figures. What's the cost of an action if we don't do these things? Now you're talking about a fruitful conversation with sales leaders that will add credibility to you and your organization. Yeah, all about outcomes. Yeah. I love it.
I love it. And so for, you know, I, I think a lot of individuals out there are also seeking, like, how do I enable myself, right? Um, there's a lot of companies, orgs, just you don't necessarily have the resource that are being handed to you. Uh, and I think a lot of reps are probably trying to learn and figure out how can I take this into my own hands and go learn and enable myself. What sort of advice would you have for any, you know, individual contributors, SDRs, anybody out there that's trying to figure out best practices around enabling themselves? So I'll go, I'll take this one. I think you have to start with, um, like I'm a huge proponent, proponent of self-education. Um, I think that you, you can't just go into a company and say, you know, I'm going to put all my growth on you. And I think like sometimes you, companies definitely have a huge responsibility in that, but you can't just expect that from them. There has to be things that you're doing continuously um, to challenge yourself to grow. Um, you know, one of the things I do, like I challenge myself to read three books a month, uh, every month this year. And so far, like this year, like I've done that. And I'm not saying you need to do something super intense, but like do something that you think is reasonable for you to do, you know, kind of on your own like growth path. And it's just so much better because then you put yourself in the driver's seat and the, in the control of your kind of your own destiny. And then you don't end up feeling like, everything that happens in a company is outside of your control and then you really take ownership of your own career and so if you start treating enablement for yourself as you're the driver of it and then anything else that happens outside of that is kind of you know is extra icing on top like then that will put you in a very productive uh headspace and that tends to be like how you know more top performers um that i've worked with that's how how they think like i'm going to teach myself how to do it you know i had a really terrible experience with enablement manager at one point in my career. And I was like, I still have this number looming over my head. I And so I went and I listened to like 50 calls. Then I practiced over and over outside of work with the top performer. You know, you can't help it. Like if you have a bad manager, like literally there are many out there and, and you still have this number, you can't just turn to your boss and say, well, you know, I had a shitty manager. It didn't work out. So you gotta, you gotta take um, ownership and responsibility. The other thing that I think is important here is that we do talk about sales enablement a lot, but no one is talking about manager enablement. And if you have one bad rep, <laughs> for last American and free, if you can have one bad rep, that, you know, you, 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 that's one quota. But if you have a bad manager, the implications of that are up to 15, you know, or more, you know, uh, potential people that you are negatively impacting. So training those managers is something that we definitely need to bring to the table as a part of the discussion of sales enablement as a whole. And I, I just think that that's so important that we, we start having a more holistic discussion around that as well. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that's, I mean, that's the reason why in my previous example, I said I took on that dual role with my previous company as a leader and I started to identify and I found, I saw their frustrations. Like I didn't have the right reporting, you know, things weren't connecting with different teams. And so I think, you know, that I absolutely agree. That's actually the extra layer we're going to tap into in the next um, two quarters. But I agree with you. Like, it's teaching people to know how to like go find the answers from how do I self enable and like you, you have to be able to empower yourself. You have to be able to self serve. So asking who are those top performers? What are they good at? Like pointing people in the right direction. And if your manager's not doing that and that's not clear, then ask like, and keep pushing for the answers, whether that's you individually or that's you asking somebody else. Like you can't stand behind somebody's not a good manager or a good leader, or we don't have a good commission structure. Or it's not clear what the expectations are. You got to be hungry to go after it because if it doesn't help you in this role, it will help you beyond and I that. Think that. I'll add that you have to take ownership of your own destiny and your own career because no one has the vested interest in it that you have. So I'll give it for two names. One, you're in sales, find out who are the top performers if, if you're new, because we all know who's killing it. Go and find that out and then make sure that you can get some time with them before I would say, take them out to lunch, get to know them. Now virtually, take them out for a virtual cup of coffee. And when you do, have some structured questions, don't waste people's time. Do it as an informational interview because it's completely non-threatening. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. I wanna learn from the best. Stroke the ego a little bit, right? It's sales mm -hmm. guys. The other <laughs> thing is if you're an enablement person, you have the best tool in the world to grow your knowledge base, which is LinkedIn. I would say go on LinkedIn and put a question out to your network. 
who are the top sales enablement people that you follow or that you believe in? And everyone on that list, go connect with them and start following and start interacting with them. Because now you can build that virtual mentorship with them or even virtual relationship. But ask the question, put it out to your network, crowdsource. It's not gonna cost you anything. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna see the same names repetitively. Mm -hmm. Those are the folks you go jump into. I love it. All, uh, all great, great stuff. Um, so I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass it to, to Chris now. We're gonna do a little, little live Q and A to get the, uh, the audience involved. If, awesome. if Chris can get his audio to work. What's up right now? I got Jake coming on. Should be Jake. You there? You coming? Uh oh. My hair? There he is. Yeah. Jake. Uh, really appreciate it. this is awesome so far uh, my question is kind of related to what you guys were just talking about but um, more about for me um, you know I'm in there we don't have sales enablement <clears throat> and we're under 10 million and I'm sure you guys can remember back to the time where you know I know I worked with Kevin in a role where he was you know everything and um, <laughs> you know I think it's hard for me to allocate my time right what how much time do I you know do with one-on-ones with training with or what I call, you know, enablement, or uh, we have these morning meetings, we do momentum, and, you know, I feel like I do a good job, but I also find myself falling asleep on the couch at 7 p.m., you know, I'm just <laughs> exhausted. And so, you know, I'm, I'm just curious to hear from other sales leaders who have been, you know, in this position, you know, how do you go about allocating your time? Has it changed when we've gone remote? Um, sorry, this is a two-part question, a three-part question, but, you know, really, really curious to hear from you guys. I, I guess I can jump in on the, the leadership side. So you're I just want to make sure I clear just as, as a leader trying to manage and maneuver all these different things that you're being asked to do, especially in a remote world. Um, I think the reality is you don't have to do it all. And that's where you can really tap into your direct reports and individual contributors to, you know, what are they really good at? Have them come into the Monday morning meeting and assign things each week. So then they can take ownership of that and they have feel like they have skin in the game and they're owning the process. And so whatever you feel that you can, um, you know, kind of get engagement from other people or bringing cross-functional departments in. I mean, that's what it's all about is like as a leader, we feel like we have to own everything right. and it's on us. But we don't like and so give those other opportunities to other people to come in, whether it's a subject matter expert from a cross functional department or even how do we work better with legal or um, having a sales rep come in and present something. And that also empowers them Still as point. well. Um, so just knowing you don't have to do it all. I, I love <laughs> it. So go for I it. Agree. Bring folks in from outside of sales. And this is great for your team. I've always said when, when I was in sales, get to know 10 people outside of the sales organization. And the reason is you're going to need them at some point, whether it's, yeah. it's rev gen, product marketing, legal, etc. Right. So bring them in and make them a part of your overall process. And that way it, it again, gets your people to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. They yeah. don't know what questions to ask legal. Most of the time, you don't know what rev gen really does until you find right. out. So start building what I call your internal partner ecosystem of all of those other departments. And, and I love what Apri said about giving that shine and that spotlight to individuals on the team. Someone's got a great process for discovery and qualification. Highlight them, have them walk through and explain why this works, not just what they do. Right, I love I, that. I love that example too. And I'm so glad that, that they also highlighted that. So I was struggling with the same sort of issue at the beginning of this year, specifically <laughs> around like the training calendar. Our CEO has, um, like a, a really big expectation of, of doing it um, weekly and, and the content really has to be superior. So one of the things I was like, well, I could do all this myself or I could crowdsource a little bit. Right, right. And this really magical thing happened across the team. Like I ended up having like an SDR lead a training on prospecting that then got the AEs prospecting more, um, which obviously helps revenue. Um, the first one we did, we had everyone in the company read a book, and one of the account managers presented on the book. And then one of the one of the concepts of the book we really reinforced. And I didn't have to really do anything. It just kind of created this ecosystem of learning where there I was like, wow, like I think like sales leaders would kill for this. They're like sharing with each other things that they learned with real examples over Slack, and I'm not doing anything. So 
Um, so that was like one of the tangible things we did this year. And so as a result of that, every Friday, it's a different person now leading and training um, every awesome. week. So that's something <clears throat> tan tangible. And it took a ton of work off my plate. I just helped them tweak the messaging and make sure their content is good and things like that. But it's a really diverse like slate of people. And, and um, that's like a really tangible way that I freed up time. But also it probably drove results a lot better than if I just did it myself. Yeah, that's awesome. Chris, you might be on mute. Oh. Another question coming in from Jonathan. See, Chris, you got that same mute button I do. Yeah, no. Yeah. It hides up. <laughs> Sneaks up on me. No. <laughs> All right. No, no, Jonathan. Wait, we had one in the chat from Eric. Eric Beaner. I think you know him too, Kevin. Uh, I've heard, heard of that guy before. <laughs> uh, various channels require different types of communication expertise, which leads to success. Most are lacking effective communication skills. Do you agree that training? Oh, no, never mind. Eric wants to know which, which channel is most effective for communication skills. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Right. It, it comes down to what you're trying to communicate, right? Exactly. You're trying to get across bullet points and quick directions, use email and, and get that out. If you've got a question and it's internal, use Slack or whatever you're using externally. When you're reaching out, quit hiding behind email and call people. Pick up the phone. For those that say that, that cold calling or warm calling is dead, you're not really in sales because it's still the foundation of what we do. Don't be afraid to talk to people, right? And also video. Video is king right now. Send the videos out, whether it's a quick PSA, whether it's a, a video intro, whether it's a quick overview. You can't use a single channel because you're going to miss out on so many other opportunities to really get in front of folks. So social media is another. Put it out there, whether it be LinkedIn, it's Insta, whatever. Learn how to best utilize and maximize each of those social media channels and then go to work. Apri, I actually had a question for you. Switching from, uh, Michael, I know you were in a remote environment already when this started, but I know Monday was not in a remote environment back in February. Having that transition from an onboarding perspective, can you give one or two practical tips of like, Hey, here's what you should be doing now in your onboarding that you shouldn't have been doing later. Like I've done the, I've heard about the virtual coffee that somebody on our team did when she onboarded and it, it's worked really well, but like, what else should we be doing virtually to onboard people? Yeah. And I'll be transparent. I'm, I haven't met my boss or any of my coworkers in person yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I joined during this time. Uh, but I think to your point, knowing where we came from and talking to people who were facilitating sessions in person and I'm working with them of, you know, well, Pri, I'm just so used to doing this. I'm like, look, we're just going to enhance it. You're not going to do anything differently. We can still give them that face-to-face -face experience. Uh, it's just understanding that they don't want to just sit on Zoom calls all day long because that's the equivalent of classroom training. You still need that blended learning experience. And it's being mindful of that, of, you know, people like we have an offsite right now with our leadership team and they're just sitting on Zoom all day long and it's, it's exhausting. So knowing that just like classroom training, you need to, to break it up to where it's not just a facilitator speaking at you all day long. How can you make this remote experience, experience whether it's onboarding or ongoing training or reinforcement or even just as a sales leader, how do you make it interactive? And so I think that's the biggest thing of just you know, having these moments of interaction. So we're doing group workshop activities and we change the groups up. And so they're learning to work with their peers that are in different roles. So it's fostering, you know, really strong relationships and kind of intimate experiences down to, you know, having those buddy systems. I, I've always been a huge proponent of mentor mentoring programs and buddy programs, but being very crystal clear of like, what does that buddy do? What does that mentor? What's the role of that mentor, you know, and buddy? And then what, as the mentee, how do you interact with them? Um, and I, we just have to continuously tap into those moments. Um, and beyond onboarding, I mean, our company, we're really great about these virtual happy hours and, 
you know, having themes to them because um, we still are humans. We want those like fun moments. Um, we're seeing each other's kids. We're seeing people's plants. We're seeing people's pets. Uh, we're seeing, you know, all the environment that's going on behind us. Uh, and so I think it's just, it's, if to me, it's, it's almost gives us a more amplified platform to accelerate what we've always done. But to Roderick's point, it's getting uncomfortable with the uncomfortable. Uh, and I think it's, honestly easier it's just being strategic about it and happy to to follow up and think about what some of those like ideas yeah. are like in practice but yeah awesome kevin you had something yeah i think one of the one of the questions a lot of um a lot of sales teams revenue teams sales leaders are, are really thinking about is like how do i keep my how do i keep my team engaged and i know a lot of people are being creative around gamification and and all sorts of things but in these, you know, again, remote, challenging, different, new environments, how do you keep everybody engaged, everyone learning, and everyone sort of, you know, more or less rowing in the same direction? Yeah, I used to, I used to really heavily rely on gamification in the office. Um, since I've been remote in the entire time at, at Chili Piper, I've re relied on it um, much less. Although we still do things to, to gamify. Um, uh, different things in the, across the company. Um, but to me, nothing really replaces like someone feeling meaningfully connected to their work. Um, and I think like th there's this idea of like, there's like, you know, you know, you, you're you not going to love your job. So I'm going to hide it with gamification at some companies. I get that vibe. Like here's a ping pong table and free lunch. And like, you can't do that in remote work. So, um, so nothing replaces feedback. Like when you ask, like so many people like what's the thing that they're craving they want feedback they want to grow they want to get better they want to get that um you know they want to get to that next point in their career they they want to feel like they're doing a good job and and that to me like really comes you know from someone feeling like they they're connected to their work and what they do really matters and i think it's really hard for you to um i i just think that that's so important for someone to first start off with feeling like uh, they're connected to the work that they're doing in a meaningful way. And, and so much of that for me has been really focusing on feedback and helping the team up their game and then letting the other things fall into place. And I think like some of these ideas I've heard um, around gamification have been great. I've written articles about gamification, so I'm not against it. I just think that if you over rely on gamification, you know, you, you, you can shoot yourself in the foot a little bit because then you just focus on that and then people always expect the reward um, when they should begin with uh, focus on doing a good job and, and, um, and the more intrinsic motivators as opposed to just being motivated by extrinsic motivators. You know, people will, people will do ultimately what you measure and train them on. So if you're always dangling some cool like free grill or luggage, which literally <laughs> what a company gave out one time during the gamification thing, like that's what they're going to be chasing. So yeah. I think it's important what you measure. Can I, I, I want to ask you a question because I, I love the idea around feedback and I think there are times where, you know, and again, back to your point around no one's enabling managers. And I think nobody is enabling managers and leaders around how to effectively give feedback. There's that, you know, check the box we gave in the presentation when it's, you know, performance reviews time, you know, um, being an, you know, an, an avid reader, has there been any books that you've read recently that you would uh, around the topic of feedback or you would, you know, suggest to those who are trying to learn more about that? Yeah, I think uh, crucial conversations um, comes up like pretty frequently. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of a sales manager survival guide as well, specifically where they're talking about directive versus indirective coaching. Um, even just like being aware of what that even means will help you be a better coach because like some people need like, hey, this is what you do. And it's super direct, you know, and to the point. But if you're not mixing that in with what do you think about this? How could you have done that better through indirective coaching? Then you're, you know, to a priest point earlier, that is, by the way, one of the most crucial points of enablement is this idea of reinforcement. Like, are you reinforcing outcomes continuously as you're going and then making sure that everyone's with you along the way? Well, one of the biggest tools in your toolbox to do that is this concept of indirect um, coaching. 
and asking uh, asking questions that gets them thinking about what they're doing creates a whole nother level of awareness in those people that you're trying to train to begin with. And then you're not spending as much time like reiterating the same things that you've taught over and over because they feel it in their bones. Like they, they understand it to their core when they have to think for themselves in order to do it. And I think like, you know, we're automating a lot of the tasks and I think so much of, uh, of, of the automation of technology of tasks and the things that we're doing are really going to force the profession to up its game because we need people who have a higher level of EQ, um, have these uh, have this uh, ability to read people more, and are really delivering on um, you know a, a lot of these things that the customer ultimately cares about. So, so those are a couple of books that I'd recommend. Love it. And I think just to add onto what Michael was saying and the pre and not not that there's a whole lot because they both rocked it. There's a couple of things that come to mind. Right now, we are in an opportunity with the situation that everything has to be more personalized. So ask questions about that individual specifically, not broadly. How are you doing with this? How do you feel about this? What are you having a difficult time with, right? And we all remember the old statement around be radically or, or add in radical candor. Well, it's to another level. Because we've never been in such a personalized situation like as right now. Look, we are in each other's homes. It doesn't get any more personalized than this, right? Mm -hmm. So as a manager, back to my point of being comfortable with getting uncomfortable, as a sales leader, when's the last time you literally asked anyone on your team, how am I doing as a manager? Mm -hmm. What can I get you as your manager that can help you succeed more? Because why? Most managers are afraid of the answer. <laughs> right, and, and if it's something that you don't know how to handle or it doesn't come back the way that you want, then there's the whole ego bruise. But if you are truly not a manager and moving towards a leader, the whole statement of if you're not prepared to be a servant, then you're not ready to be a leader. Mm -hmm. You've got to serve your team. That means asking them questions about them, and it's also about showing them and modeling vulnerability by asking them questions about how you're doing and how you can improve as a leader, not just how I can be a better manager. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only thing I would add into, because I, I love that, <laughs> is the, the, the meaningful understanding of being yes. present. Because we can do, we can read all the books that we can read. We can ask these questions. But if I'm on a call and you're looking, I can tell you're looking at five other screens or you're looking at your phone, then it's all for naught. And I can come tell you from experience on, I think my boss, boss um, Ange might even be on this. Like I've never had someone be more present and she would even look at, you know, come to me and say, Hey, you're distracted. Like shut that down. And that meant something to me. And even my current boss, like that's one thing that, you know, when I in performance review of three months, I said, there's nothing I want you to change. Keep doing what you're doing because I, I feel like I'm in just a, a blank room with nothing around us when we're having these conversations. And if there's one little bit of distraction, like we have to be able to emulate what we expect of them when they're on customer calls, et cetera. But especially in these moments where we're asking for feedback or giving feedback, shut it all down because it, it will completely shift the experience. You guys are, you guys are amazing. Like tons and tons and tons of knowledge. Really, 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 really inspiring. inspiring. Oh, really, really your mic shit the bed. Oh, that's an hour, an hour, that's an hour. That was telling you to go. Uh, Kevin has a hard stop, I think, at one. We're going to do networking for the last 15 minutes. If anyone wants to jump into networking, um, thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, I dropped the link to Addicted to Growth in there. Um, if anyone wants to hear more of what uh, Michael and Roderick have to say. Um, but otherwise, we hope to see you in a couple weeks. We have Chris Walker, uh, Andrea Kale from Electric AI, and... Ashley Dilbert from Piano um, on our marketing uh, event. So hope to see everyone in two weeks and I hope to meet some of you in the networking portion. Roderick, Michael, Apri, thank you so much. You guys were awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. See you networking, hopefully. <laughs>